Hi, everybody. This is Joel Butterly. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ingenious Prep. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about how to prepare for college as an 11th grader. Um, so there are a handful of more obvious things that you probably already know about. You know that your GPA in 11th grade is particularly important and you want to either keep it up or improve it, depending on where you're at already. Um, the You know that you should have taken or be preparing to take uh, standardized tests in most cases. Um, as a side note to that, uh, I, I know that tests are now optional at a lot of places, um, a lot of schools. However, it's probably best to assume they're not optional for you, um, the, that you should take them and do well. And if you don't do well in the test, you just don't submit the score. Um, you should obviously start thinking about which colleges you want to, you want to go to. Uh, do you want to go to a big school? Do you want to go to a small school? Do you care about the geography? Do you, do you care about the sports teams? Do you care about class size? how many students per class or the ratio of professors to students, you need to think about what really matters to you. Because if, if you really want a school where you get a lot of attention from professors, you're not going to get that at a large state university. Um, the, you're going to get that at like a liberal arts college. Um, and, and that is a, the, quite a large difference between those two. Um, so you need to, to think about all that. One thing that I recommend to everyone that I think is perhaps the least well-considered variable in selecting colleges is post-graduation opportunities. That is to say, it might be wonderful to go to Harvard, but or let's, let's use Yale, wonderful to go to Yale. But if you want to be a computer scientist, there are a lot of sort of less selective schools with much more reputable computer science departments. Um, and so it's not entirely clear that going to Yale over, say, you know, Georgia Tech or UIUC, if you're determined to become, uh, you know, be, be a CS major and go into software development, not entirely clear that that's a, a superior choice, although it would be a hard choice for most people, I'm sure. Um, so you need to think about post-graduation opportunities, things like what types of industries do people go into? Uh, if you're really interested in working on Wall Street, you want to go to one of the schools that does on-campus recruiting events with Wall Street firms. Um, if you go to a school that doesn't have that, um, it's going to be extremely hard to get those jobs. So it's be worth going to a lower-ranked school um, that is, is a good pathway to your ultimate career um, than going to the higher-ranked school that is a bad pathway. Um, so you want to consider a whole bunch of variables, put together a preliminary college list. That list should be 20 to 30 schools in length. Um, that's sort of the preliminary. And you'll probably cut it down to 10 or 12 when you actually apply. Um, it's a good idea to have, you know, five or six reach schools um, in this in, in this preliminary list, at least five, at least five or six. Um, and you'll cut it down a little bit when you actually apply. Most people are applying to, say, four to six total reach schools, um, depending on the student and depending how qualified they are. Um, if you have a chance in 11th grade, touring colleges is great. Um, I, a word of caution on touring colleges is that so much of your impression of the school is going to be based on things like the weather that day and whether you like the person doing the tour. Um, uh, it, neither of those things are representative of the school at all. Um, the, the, you know, so if you if you go to uh, Harvard on a really cloudy day and then Princeton on a really sunny day, you're likely to have a better impression of Princeton, although Princeton, New Jersey is no more cloudy or less cloudy um, than Boston, Massachusetts or Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so, uh, so, so you have to be careful about inferring too much from a limited sample size. The other thing is that the tour guide, they vary hugely in terms of their quality, their engagedness, their general charm. Um, the, you know, the, I remember when I was doing my college tours, um, uh, I got just the best tour guide at Yale. Um, he, you know, really unbelievable, so passionate. He was this kind of charming athlete guy um, who was super nice and warm to everyone, clearly incredibly enthusiastic about um, you know, about, about this work. And he was clearly doing the work because he just loved the school. He wasn't doing it, you know, cause he needed money and he wasn't doing it cause he was forced to in any way. Um, so he was spectacular. I actually had a, a, a tour. It was either the day before or the very next day, um, at Harvard and the person was doing it as part of like work study, which means that they were doing this so that they could, uh, they could earn money, um, as a way of supplementing their, their tuition payments. They were not interested in doing this. Um, we're clearly more of an introvert. Um, and, you know, I got kind of a terrible impression. But the reality is that's one person at the school. And these are big schools with a lot of people. So 
Um, one of my recommendations is don't read too much into things that might be a result of a small sample size, things like the weather, things like the tour guide. Um, try not to read into, into those things. Um, another suggestion would be find other students, usually like on the green or on the quad or wherever it might be, find other students who are not tour guides and just introduce yourself and ask them for their opinion on the school. What makes it different? What makes it distinctive? Um, you can learn a lot more about a school that way because the tour guides are also going to present you with a very specific view of the school. Um, you know, a simple example would be um, I went to Dartmouth College, um, as did my wife. Um, and, uh, you know, Dartmouth, they'll, you know, if you go tour Dartmouth, uh, they'll talk to you about it's very outdoorsy, it's very athletic, like great liberal arts, great undergraduate education, all those things are true. Uh, but they're not going to tell you that there's sort of a riotous fraternity culture. There's not so much anymore that's kind of gotten shut down. But they're not going to talk about uh, talk about that um, as a, a defining feature of the Dartmouth collegiate experience. But in my experience, it, it really, really was. I mean, the whole social life of the school revolved around the Greek system. Um, and uh, that was not great for some people. Um, the, so uh, in any event, I think if you were to talk to people, just go to on the green at Dartmouth and you were to ask them, like, tell me what makes this school distinctive. A hundred percent, they're going to be bringing up the fraternities and, and the way that the social life works at that school, because it is radically different from schools like Columbia um, or you know Cornell. Um, OK, so that's that's uh, touring colleges. Um, the next thing I would say is. You, you really want to start thinking about your application persona. So I, I've talked about this application persona idea in a whole bunch of different videos. The basic concept is simple. An application persona is the theme of your application. It's the one sentence summary that I would use to summarize you after I've read your application. So if you have a whole bunch of activities and essays about being an environmental activist, your persona is environmental activist. Um, the personas are extremely important because they they highlight and magnify the thing that differentiates you from other students. Um, and in addition to, to doing that, um, they make you a lot more memorable to an admissions officer. So if an admissions officer reads a thousand applications and needs to remember yours in order to kind of go back to it, they need to have some sort of, you know, shorthand in their mind, uh, like, oh, I want to go back to that environmentalist kid. But if your whole application is like 10, it's like talking about 10 different people. I'm a philanthropist, I'm an activist, I'm a uh, I'm a an athlete, I'm a scholar, right? It's very, very hard to remember an application like that. So um, it's extremely effective. Now, what you basically want to do is you want to sit down, look at all your activities and ask yourself the question, is there a common theme of my activities and awards? Like is my research with a, a, a professor in political science and my debate in Model UN, are these grouped together as sort of like politics theme? Um, and you want to see if there is an obvious theme that emerges. Um, if one does, great. Your next step is to expand upon that theme by completing ideally one or more what I would call capstone extracurricular activities. These are extracurricular activities that I think convey to schools a level of sophistication and expertise well above and beyond the norm. Um, so those are, in order, uh, uh, internships where you are capable of producing real tangible achievements. So you can report to me what actually you accomplished. If you say, I'm a high schooler, I worked at Google, I know for sure that what you were doing was working a filing cabinet. If you say, I worked at a three-person private equity group and helped acquire a $5 million business, I know that you were really in the thick of it and you learned. Um, so that's that's internships. Tangible achievements key. Don't think too much about the size of the organization or the reputation of the organization. That matters less. Um, the, the second is uh, academic research. Working with a professor, uh, writing your own research paper, trying to get it published. This showcases academic expertise. The, the fact that you are able to work at a you know, collegiate or even potentially graduate level, um, the, you know, this is the sort of thing, these kinds of research papers and publications, these are things that most students don't do until grad school um, and only a small handful do in, in college and usually it's in the senior year. Um, so that can be extremely valuable as well. And there's a number of programs, including our own program where we offer access to, to these professors. Um, uh, so you can find that online or if you have, you know, uh, connections to a professor, you can ask them or you can do cold outreach. I did cold outreach when I was in high school, which was hard. 
Um, the and, and not very successful, but the um, but but it, it, it I have seen it work. Um, the last thing is something entrepreneurial, starting your own company, your own nonprofit, your own media platform. Um, this is the hardest one to do. It's also the rarest. Um, so it has a lot of value if it can be done correctly. Um, we have a what we call our leadership and innovation lab, which is a, basically a startup incubator uh, for students to create companies and nonprofits, and then has an entrepreneur in residence. Um, I would recommend, uh, unless one of your parents has a lot of expert, expertise um, in, in entrepreneurship, or you have some other really involved advisor, um, it's probably worth doing that with an advisor, because the goal of, of doing something like that is, again, tangible achievements. How many people did you hire? How many products did you sell? How much money did you raise? How many people did you help? Those are the things that are going to you know really make a difference. We had a student a couple of years back who uh, created an organization to help uh, homeless uh, the, or help this, the homeless population in Malibu, California. Um, and uh, by the end of his 11th grade year, he'd raised $300,000 for it, which was obviously spectacular. Um, he's very proud of that. And, uh, you know, this was a student who, you know, probably would have been lucky to get into sort of UCLA or UC Berkeley um, at, at the time. He was, he was a very good student, but that would have been sort of and on the stretch side for him, and he ended up at Stanford. Um, the that kind of experience is just so rare and so impressive. Um, so in any event, um, if you know, if you see an, a theme emerge, try at least one of these capstone experiences. This is an, in an ideal world if you're shooting for the most competitive schools. Um, the roughly speaking, the top thirty, um, the um, or the top ten liberal arts colleges. Um, now, the second is if no application persona emerges at all, then you have a lot of freedom, but you also don't have much time. So you really got to get working. Um, the first thing to figure out is what are you really passionate about? Maybe you start by thinking about what, what, what are you going to major in in college? That doesn't have to be how you find it. Or you can think about just what you spend the most time on that you really like. As long as it is, as it is a thing that is plausibly related to what a school teaches. So, for example, music and sports are hard because most universities don't specialize in those. They're like conservatories for, for, for musicians and things like that, and art and design schools for artists. Um, so that can be a little bit harder, but if it's like any academic discipline, if it's entrepreneurship, finance, econ, um, you know, anything that is sort of within the realm of uh, the kind of scholarly disciplines, um, uh, that counts. Um, and then your goal is to build an extracurricular profile um, uh, starting with some small things in, you know, in, in class or on, sorry, or rather on campus, maybe joining some student groups, um, and then graduating into these kind of capstone experiences. The capstone experiences are, are, are quite important, but you usually need to have some foundation um, in the subject before you can sort of jump right into these capstone experiences. Um, that's, in my opinion, the most important thing to be done in 11th grade. You're running out of time in terms of when you can alter your profile. Um, you know, it's like the application is just a reflection of the things that you have been doing since ninth grade. Um, and you still have time to change the like the raw ingredients. Like you're you're making a, an admissions soup um, and you can use kind of three day old ingredients or you might have an opportunity to add, you know, really fresh fish um, on that final day, which is your 11th grade year. Um, obviously, that is going to improve your admissions chances more than how you serve the soup. Um, so I'm not sure if that was a particularly successful analogy, but um, um, hopefully it made sense. Um, OK, um, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments section. Someone from our company uh, will will find them um, and feel free to request more videos. I'm, I'm happy to record them as long as they're helpful to folks. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about sort of these capstone experiences uh, that we offer, just reach out um, and, and we can tell you more about those. Um, but uh, I wish you guys all the best luck. Um, it's going to be an intense but very productive period of time for you. Um, and it will be over soon. And when it is over, um, you'll have a, a decent break, um, which uh, is, is really, really fantastic. So um, talk to you all soon. Bye bye.